to protect our men who are in Vietnam and to guarantee the continued success of our withdrawal and Vietnamization programs, I have concluded that the time has come for action. This is President Richard Nixon at the start of his address to the nation on the night of April 30th, 1970, a Thursday just after 9 p.m. Seven minutes later, he would announce that in cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. This announcement was not well received by many. Less than two years prior, Nixon had campaigned and won on a promise that he had a secret plan to end the war. In the month that followed, the nation, and college campuses in particular, erupted into anti-war demonstrations. And despite its long-standing history of ivory tower stoicism, Princeton was at the heart of the movement. Dick Nixon went on the air and announced that he had invaded Cambodia. That announcement seemed to be the last straw, and it was a turning point, I think, in undergraduate uh, sentiment about the war. It was a really weird time uh, to be in college, and I cannot begin to emphasize that enough. People were hoping that there was a gradual disengagement going on in the war, and they were shocked. The month of protests and strikes that followed shattered any sense of normalcy. Princeton's semester ground to a halt. While the Vietnam War roiled the United States, students of color, and particularly Asian American students, confronted racism on Princeton's campus and throughout the country. Fifty years later, as the novel coronavirus engulfs the world and people across the United States fight against systemic racism, those efforts resonate today. The atmosphere was incredibly combustible, uh, tremendously unpredictable. Uh, people in a great state of tension and furor. It felt betrayed, it felt shocked, it felt scared because it looked like this was a really a war without end. Just a few hours after Nixon's announcement, more than 2,500 students, riding a wave of energy, confusion, and anger, gathered in the university chapel to devise a plan for action. Again, it was electric, uh, it was unprecedented. There was a group of people um, who were in charge of the meeting. That group of students, according to Kerrigan, were likely members of Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, a left-wing activist group that had been demonstrating against the war for years. It was almost like a predetermined decision had been made that yes, we are going to go on strike. While the student body was swept up in the meeting, none of the administrators in attendance felt it was their place to act. There was no way we could or should have tried to stop them, but we had to try to direct the stream if possible to make sure it didn't do things that were really against all common sense or all regulations. Just before midnight, bomb threats, later proven to be false alarms, at both the chapel and the nearby Institute for Defense Analyses, forced the students to evacuate. But on their way out, one student, frustrated at what he saw as hypocrisy in the SES's desire to strike against the university rather than the U.S. government, broke ranks and ran to the front of the assembly, where Dean of the Chapel Ernest Gordon, a World War II veteran and former prisoner of war, was standing. I don't know where this idea came from, but I kind of said, uh, as I came forward, you know, I, I looked for him and I said, please take my, my draft card. It's a more subdued description than his friends used. According to Carl Frankel, Kerrigan grabbed his draft card and he went running down the central aisle, shouting out to everyone in attendance, and there must have been a thousand people in attendance or many, a whole lot of people, you're all hypocrites. If you don't burn your draft card, you're all hypocrites. An unknown number of students followed in Kerrigan's footsteps that evening, and 190 more followed suit at a similar gathering two days later. After that first night, as the calendar flipped to May, students left the chapel energized, emboldened, and ready to act. But there was little gained in the way of clarity. The, the word strike was in there, but nobody even knew what that meant, or didn't mean. That was determined really the following Monday. At this time, then, all those who support proposal number one, the proposal submitted by the Council of the Princeton University community, please raise your hand. The administration uh, sort of instantaneously read the mood of what was going on uh, and had a community meeting uh, for anybody who wanted to come. 
uh, on Monday afternoon beginning at one o'clock uh, in Jablin, which at that point was only one year old. That meeting saw over 5,000 university community members gather to discuss and vote on three separate proposals. The first had been discussed and proposed a day earlier in a meeting of the recently founded Council of the Princeton University Community, or CPUC. It suggested the university as a whole take a stance directly against the invasion and that the community should use its resources and manpower to make that opposition practical. It would also see academics come to a halt for those who wanted to partake in the strike, giving extensions on final assignments and exams until the fall for non-seniors, and taking out senior comprehensive exams for those not in the running for honors. The second, more left-wing proposal was supported by many members of the SDS. It called on the university to take action closer to home and would have severed ties with ROTC and IDA while foregoing all funding from the Department of Defense. And a third proposal, proposed by the equally new Anti-Strike Committee, would have kept business as usual. But by a great margin, it was the first proposal that for a university strike and collective statement that was most popular. It got over 2,000 votes of the 4,000 people there. Uh, the left-wing proposal, uh, backed by SDS and others, got about 1,500 votes. And I think probably the most telling thing to show you uh, where things lay at Princeton was that the proposal to continue with business as usual got 180 votes out of 4,000. There was a sense, distinct sense that there were kind of two cultures at Princeton even then. I have not managed to square how you could have two cultures at Princeton, the sort of strike culture and the liberal radical culture with the fact that the vote to go on strike was so overwhelming. We were in shock, you know, especially when the administration and everybody else supported the you know, the more motto position that we lost, the fact that we, we even to kind of had that much support for it was a, a significant. But the idea that you could just sit there and do it the way you were normally doing it was completely abandoned by a gigantic proportion of the campus. This county is official. 2,066 persons supported it. There's something going on over the other side of the podium that we're not able to see at the moment. And a chant of strike, strike, as you can hear in the background. Half an hour before this meeting began at Jadwin, four students were killed at Kent State by the Ohio National Guard. Absolutely no reason to fire a gun at all uh, on that occasion. And they, as you know, they killed several people and wounded uh, many others. And that was, that was a, a, a turning point, I think, in a certain sense, for the whole country. You didn't have to go to Vietnam to be killed. <laughs> you could be killed right here. Yeah. So, uh, so that kind of added a whole new sense of urgency. It was just kind of the pigs against the people, right? And this, and that was the structure. And although we were pigs in training because we were very white and very privileged, um, we were definitely siding as a class with the uh, with the oppressed. That sympathy manifested in well-attended vigils on campus in the following days. At one point, according to the Daily Princetonian, students nearly burst in on a faculty meeting after a false rumor spread that the death count in Ohio had reached six. At the same time, the administration was hard at work keeping the school from some of the pitfalls which peer institutions had found in handling demonstrations of previous years. I mean, I was thinking about what happened to our campus in comparison to Columbia, Harvard, Yale, the other campuses, it really seemed to just disintegrate almost. Uh, I didn't think we did that. And I, I thought that our campus and our president had the highest respect for President Goheen, uh, really was showed some very strong leadership and thoughtful leadership. I, I think his calmness, authority, kindness, and uh, care that probably were shaped by his World War II experience uh, benefited the university. and. Uh, it, it certainly um, kept Princeton from exploding. I was particularly concerned about two things. One, the need to consult um, broadly with faculty and students so that the administration was not acting kind of capriciously or alone uh, uh, without support and without consultation. And second, probably most important, uh, was the feeling that I had strongly, but others as well had, do not call the police, do not have a bus, do not hurt your own students. That was crucial. 
The faculty, too, were deeply occupied with figuring out how best to proceed after the Jadwin meeting. The faculty spent a whole week after that, every afternoon, four to five hundred members in attendance uh, debating the issues. And the net result of that was that the council's recommendations were upheld. But the faculty meets in the faculty room of Nassau Hall, the big fancy room. Rarely is that room full, full for a faculty meeting. But at this time, the meetings were so well populated that we had to find a much bigger room in which to meet. And the room originally chosen was uh, Makash Tan. It was during these meetings that the faculty provided leniency to students for the rest of the semester, delaying final due dates and exams until the fall for those students who wanted to focus on the strike. On the fly, they set up a way for people who wanted to continue with their academic progress forward to do exactly that, for the people who wanted to work on anti-war stuff full-time to do exactly that, and for people who wanted to try and do different things in different combinations to drop, try and do those as well. Princeton was one of the, I believe, three universities that let the students um, put all their studies on hold and gave us a break. We didn't have to take final exams if we chose not to. It gave us an opportunity to um, express our political views and to do something about it. The good deal for us was that our senior comprehensive exams were canceled. Because how can you have senior comprehensive exams when you're invading Cambodia? The Ivy League institutions were uh, like a series of rafts in a river that was that was flooding and the water was rushing downstream and they did not manage the flow of the river. They reacted and they really didn't see a choice because the culture was so adamantly anti-war that they just had to sort of surf it. I can't possibly overemphasize how successful the faculty and the administration were uh, in pulling this off in a circumstance that no one had ever imagined and certainly couldn't really prepare for. Benefiting from the decision of the faculty to provide lenience in end-of-term work, one large group of students made their way to John von Neumann Hall, a building just off the eastern end of campus leased by the Institute for Defense Analyses. The IDA was a military contractor, drawing on some university scientists for its classified research. Students surrounded the building, spray-painting it and preventing its employees from entering. They stayed there for five days, sleeping in tarp tents. The, the demonstrations at IDA actually going back to late 1967, and it, it pretty much played out. It was sort of old news, and all of this brought it back to the surface again. President Goheen would later say, in reference to the IDA, that this was not Princeton, but to the protesters who occupied the front lawn for days on end, the Institute was at least a gateway to the change they wanted. They you know, could claim that it wasn't part of the university, but what we were trying to say is that the university should cut its ties with the uh, with IDA in general, and the university should cut its ties with people who are giving defense contracts. Well, I found it difficult to uh, maintain the logical sequencing of an inference chain, which led from vandalizing our building to stopping the war. If the university was serious, if people were serious about being against war, then we should actually cut our ties to the war. We weren't working on the war, and I, I didn't see how it had, how it was going to help. It's a difference in perspective that Neuwirth and Tarla have debated for 50 years, but at the time, it might have been overshadowed by a devastating parallel to what had happened at Kent State just days earlier. At the head of the IDA was really not a very steady uh, fellow at all, and his first instinct was to call the National Guard. I did everything I could to try to influence them to avoid actions which would uh, induce a repetition of what happened at Kent State. Fortunately, the head of IDA was talked out of that, but the sit-in went on for several days, and I kept uh, hoping that there would be a massive thunderstorm. The weather remained clear enough to protest, and disconnect between students and the employees they impeded remained high. It didn't cost them anything, so I had that feeling also that these demonstrations didn't, their opinions didn't cost them anything. Whereas uh, for other people, uh, there, maybe their opinions were, they meant something. So I had, I had mixed feelings. Generally I thought though that the demonstrations probably were a good idea. Being in Princeton at the time, 
getting arrested uh, was, you know, somebody is putting our, you know, putting our bodies where our, our mouth was. The head of IDA finally called for a court order to have the students removed. Uh, and if they didn't leave uh, the sit-in, uh, they'd be held in contempt. But, but the idea of people kind of, you know, being angry and making, you know, the, the campus at that time not functional and trying to, you know, have such outrage, and not only is that legitimate, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's how, you know, movements start and that's how you try and, you know, get the war to end. President Goheen would say that if students wanted to protest the university, they should have taken the fight to Nassau Hall. One student did exactly that. Early in the morning of May 13th, William Burlingham, then a freshman, was apprehended for setting fires in both the IDA and the basement of old Nassau. And luckily, uh, the damage was contained. But you know, that, that shows the, the element of, of passion, uh, even to the point of uh, uh, destroying history. And everybody thought pretty much that the Willie Burlingans of the world were kind of nuts at the time, that this was really over the top and you shouldn't be going around setting uh, buildings on fire to protest the war. But it was kind of on the same order of moral reprehensibility as being in Ronson <laughs> for, the, for the sort of the folks in the middle. And there were incidents involving um, protests and taking it out against the ROTC structure and and the students who were involved in ROTC only because they seemed to be an extension of the, the military complex that we blamed for the Vietnam War. None of it looked good or right to me as we were doing that, but this is what we had. Uh, and uh, that's what we were going to end up doing. And uh, I felt that our responsibility would be as young officers to do the best we could and do the right thing and and uh, improve our military. I was an eyewitness uh, to uh, the, the mobs in front of the Hilton Hotel in Chicago and the, the anger and the, the, uh, the police riot, which was a police riot. We, we were hauling stretchers of kids who had their heads cracked by um, uh, batons and, and were bleeding. So I, I, I was a, a obviously uh, a bit conflicted because here I was uh, getting ready the next summer to go back off to the Marine Corps and I was seeing uh, up close and very personal the uh, effects of uh, the anti-war protest. I had very mixed feelings about the war. Uh, I never once questioned that if asked to serve that I would serve. I had taken the scholarship so I put my word uh, and uh, my honor on the line. I was going to uphold that, uh, but I was continuing to do what I thought was the best thing to do. On the ground, um, I didn't have time to think about whether this was being waged badly. Um, but uh, in subsequent years, in reading the McNamara, uh, the, the Pentagon Papers, and, and reading McNamara's Mia Culpa, and how uh, the uh, concentration on uh, body count and war of attrition was really a, a stupid way of prosecuting the war. Uh, you know, I, I, I fully embrace it, and, and uh, I mourn the loss of life uh, that resulted from it. That year, on May 3rd, the University Council voted 28 to 13 with two abstentions to work towards ending its ROTC affiliations. Soon after, Princeton disbanded its ROTC Army, Navy, and Air Force programs. The Army program was reinstated just two years later, but it was decades before Princeton participated in a Navy or Air Force ROTC program again. While the council came to decisions that would have ramifications for years to come, and some students focused their efforts on demonstrations and protests, others broadened their scope. We initiated very rapidly uh, taking a group of students down to Washington, D.C. to investigate and take a look at defense weapon systems and to do something to help improve them. One of the proposals was to create an organization uh, called Movement for a New Congress that would attempt to engage students uh, nationwide in congressional campaigns. That was um, approved. Um, by later that day, there were about 400 Princeton students who had uh, joined the movement. Um, and very shortly, Princeton became the sort of national headquarters. The extraordinary non 
the movement called the International Draft Opposition, or under the best thing about it. On it, there are two good things that are very good about it. One was it was a kind of a neat acronym, Union for National Draft Opposition, under. And the other thing is that we got a write up in Playboy magazine. It was a very loose umbrella organizations that were really never tied together. And you sort of just did your thing and let other people worry about their thing. To facilitate some of this action, students proposed a two-week fall break for campaigning purposes. The administration approved installing a recess that year, which, as a one-week vacation, exists to this day. That break, however, was scarcely the biggest change at the university in that era. In few years has Princeton experienced more growth than in those overseen by Goheen, with Carl A. Fields, the university's first black administrator, in the role of assistant dean of the college. Throughout this time and beyond, many students of color continued to experience the struggle of attending what had, for over 200 years, been an almost entirely white institution. When I got to Princeton, I think, um, you know, academically, I was prepared for it. Um, what I was not prepared for was the sort of sense of social isolation. I think that the administration um, became very aware of divisiveness on campus and the um, isolation that students of color were finding. And at a time when the nation was at war with Vietnam, Asian American students found that their presence on campus was particularly conspicuous. Because most non-Asians think of all Asians look alike, and they all have the same perspective, that it gave our voice a little more weight because it was as though we were speaking for the South Vietnamese. We were being their voice, if not just their face. While many remember the killings at Kent State early that May, less well remembered was a police shooting at Jackson State, a historically black university in Mississippi just 10 days later. 12 were injured and two black students were killed. At Princeton, a disparity in student activism perhaps foreshadowed the eventual disparity in national memory behind these two events. One of the things that really struck me was that the African-American students from the Association of Black Collegians stood up in a couple of the teach-ins and said, you know, we're not for the war, but we're not going to engage in anti-war activities because there's too much to do in our own communities. You know, there's poverty, there are housing shortages, there are health issues, there are all kinds of issues in our own community. We're going to go back to our own community and work there. So I think that also spoke to us Asian-Americans as well. Indeed, many students of color opted to use the time freed by the strike for other purposes. Carlton Brown, class of 73, traveled to New Haven for a rally in support of two formative members of the Black Panther Party, who were imprisoned and on trial. And so they were having this huge free Bobby Seal and, and Erica Huggins thing, and I think they'd already say classes were suspended. So we went up to Yale to this big thing, and it was going, it was finding groovy until the police or the National Guard or somebody started shooting tear gas into the crowd. And so that was, that spring was the first time and only time in my life I've been tear gassed, right? And it didn't happen on, at Princeton, right? And it happened there on Yale's campus, right? And the thing about it, it was the same sort of circumstances you know, I've seen on television uh, recently that people doing peaceful protests, you know, um, militarized police come out with batons uh, and tear gas, and they work on tell turning a peaceful demonstration into um, a riot by the state. Right? Brown's ability to relate his experience half a century ago to the issues plaguing the nation in 2020 is, unfortunately, not unique. It was quite clear from the returning GIs that were Asian American, that the American soldiers were taught, basically brainwashed, to mm -hmm. look at Asians and say, well, they're all gooks and they're all the enemy. You know, because we were feeling that, we were feeling the effects of the racism then too, mm -hmm. when every night on television or the, the body counts of, you know, how many of the enemy, the, uh, you know, Victor Charlie's, the VCs, the gooks were killed that day. I see soldiers or they would be uniform or, traveling and I remember a few occasions it was, good. It was quite tense so uh, because you know the enemy was Asian and here I was pretty clearly not 
conforming to, to mainstream standards it needs to be in front of parents. Personally, I, I on campus, yeah, I, I did not feel uh, <clears throat> uh, that much of racism. You know, it was subtle and uh, <clears throat> um, slight, but on campus it wasn't serious. I didn't really experience that much on campus, I don't think. I would say it would have been before and after when I was, say, you know, in Philadelphia and Boston. Uh, you know, people call you gook, people would call you mama san. Uh, mm. You know, people would uh, make different gestures at you. So, I mean, there's a whole history of this. Uh, you know, and uh, if you look at the historical record, you'll see that, you know, it's not just people calling people names, but basically there are a lot of laws, especially on the West Coast. At this point with a, a virus, um, you know, there's an insistence on calling that virus Chinese, and that has contributed to the spiking of, of hate violence, hate speech, um, hateful activity toward uh, toward Chinese Americans and anybody who looks Chinese. Mm -hmm. So similar to the time in, in 1970, when anybody who looked Vietnamese um, would be considered an enemy, anybody who looks Chinese now is also uh, being treated as though they are the enemy. Well, it is a continuation of historic anti-Asian sentiment that has been part of American history since the mid-1800s. There has been always this conflict between Western Europeans and, and the reality or image of Asia. And I think that in the 21st century, this is going to come again to the fore, especially given all this history about China right now. While it's unclear how the rest of the 21st century will unfold, 50 years ago, an identity was formed on campus and across the nation. The 1969 and 1970 were the years of the opening or the beginnings of uh, what we call Asian American movement, particularly East Coast. So there were a number of student conferences uh, in New York and at Yale, uh, Princeton. Uh, so I was involved in attending those and speaking at some of those. So they were uh, really quite um, important in galvanizing, uh, bringing together uh, Asian Americans at the time. Uh, also, it was uh, probably the first opportunity where the Asian and Asian American students got together. We bought an ad in the Prince, a whole page ad. You know, the Asian American students came together um, and, you know, formed to form an organization, but also to be part of the dialogue with the other uh, students of color, which we called ourselves third world students. For historical reasons, I, I think that there was always a bit of tension between black students and the students defined as white. The slave society, based on white supremacy, slavery on campus, and on so of course, that's like a, a dark cloud, I'm, I'm this thing hanging above us. I don't recall any such tension dealing with Asian American students because of, of, of the absence of, of that conflicted history. I started to really try to understand and appreciate my roots, my heritage, and understand circumstances under which my family came to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And as well to think about giving back to my community and seeing how my community was existing in a context of marginalization and uh, I felt that, you know, I had an obligation to do something about that. So many of us boycotted commencements, yeah. feeling that it was not time to celebrate. And so most of us, uh, well, I can't say most of us, many of us decided to return to our communities to do service or mm -hmm. to engage in political activities there. Although not every senior would boycott the event, commencement that year was unusual on the whole. The seniors met on May 6th, uh, two days after the large meeting in Jadwin. Uh, and as part of all of this, uh, they voted uh, rather overwhelmingly to uh, forego most of the traditional senior activities. This forswearing of tradition included not marching in the P-Raid, giving up class day in favor of a teach-in, and wearing armbands in place of caps and gowns at commencement. But key to the whole month was the idea of choice. We voted not to engage in most of the traditions and rituals of Princeton commencement. 
but we also voted not to impede anyone in our class who chose to do otherwise. You know, the idea was most students in the senior class were not going to wear caps and gowns, but if you wanted to do that, you could do that. The, our sense of coercion was that that was the real enemy as distinct from any particular political view. But while students, faculty, and the administration allowed each other freedoms, all were captive to one particular menace. There were, you know, a few billion cicadas all over everything on front campus. It was a brood of the bugs that comes out every 17 years in central New Jersey. Our speakers were Coretta Scott King, uh, who was fabulous, and uh, some uh, little-known entertainer uh, named Bob Dylan, who, uh, whose remarks were drowned out because this was the uh, year of the 17-year locusts. Dylan would go on to write Day of the Locusts about his experience on campus, a song that ends with him singing, sure was glad to get out of there alive. He was just completely panic-stricken by all of these crazy people, and, and in point of fact, he, he really sort of had a case. Dylan and Scott King were joined in speaking that day by Ray Gibbons, the valedictorian of the class of 70, who had perhaps a more unusual month than most. I had people who I didn't really know very well uh, come by to try to find out what I was going to say and to tell me what they thought I should say. The valedictorian's roommates took it upon themselves to keep unwanted visitors out, and while he did note that it would be a peculiar anachronism to be fully apolitical at such a time, he tried to avoid the more radical stances taken by his peers throughout the month. I didn't get rave reviews from anybody in my class, which uh, I suspect meant that I had succeeded in the balanced view that I was trying to present. Gibbons' balanced approach gained the respect of at least one of the notable speakers that day. After the event, Coretta Scott King reportedly told him, Your remarks were wise, thoughtful, and balanced, and uh, I thought they were, as she put it, very, very strong for those reasons. And for somebody of your age, that's pretty amazing. That was enough for me. In a time of change and growth, these students found an opportunity to reimagine themselves in the university they were attending. As the class of 1970 left campus after a spring no one would soon forget, they had a chance to leave one last symbolic gesture. The last thing we did was to open uh, Fitz Randolph Gate permanently. The, there's an iconic photograph of our class president at the time, Stu Dillard McBride, and a few other people sort of leading the way in um, as the gates had been opened. Uh, and it really was a symbolic moment. It was, it was, it was a very moving uh, moment. Um, and I think that the class of 2020 will have its own time and, and find its own way. Um, they don't have to replicate that moment. They, you can't. Uh, but, but they will have their own ceremony and their own... The, the symbolism that they arrive at, however they do, uh, will, will have as much meaning for them as, as they go forward in, in, over the decades as ours did for us. Uh, all these years later, looking back on the whole thing, on all the activity with uh, Congress and draft cards and the chapel, uh, of all of the stuff that happened, I think the, the opening of Fitz Randolph Gate is uh, what lasts. As the class moved on and joined the ranks of the Princeton alumni community, adopting the cicada as a now bemusing class mascot, many found that the disrupted spring, and indeed the era at large, had given them a sense of shared accomplishment and unity, and of pride in the institution. Uh, I felt that our class uh, were, quite, uh, were, were quite united, actually. Um, there's a sense of comradeship, of having gone through you know, an, an experience. Although there are still you know, a range of ideologies, you know, and, and there are differences in opinion. But generally, uh, I, I would say that <clears throat> uh, my, my class was uh, my classmates were a lot of most of them are very tolerant of diversity. The class uh, loves Princeton uh, very much as its home, but additionally uh, as a set of ideas because it's always changing and it's always improving, and that's the way it should always be. For those outside the graduating class who were on campus, it was an equally revolutionary time. In the words of John Samada, class of 72, at the Jadwin Assembly earlier that month, the only way anything can be stopped abroad is to stop things here. A student strike is nothing. 
this institution must make a stand and must defend that stand. We sort of arrived on this campus where um, it was certain about his past and totally uncertain about his future, right? Um, and so it was, um, that was true of the administration, that was true of the student body, um, that was true of the alumni. And some Chinese Americans were also getting politicized, but uh, the, the questions they were asking was not only the relationship of U.S. with Asia, right, in general, but more so it was a search for identity. We can't just live in fear or in a defensive mode. Really, we have to think about how do we move forward? Um, what do we learn from this? What can we learn from previous times? And what that means is taking the understanding that we have of what's going on, realizing we're not the only ones. When um, hate is directed at any one group, it's really directed at everybody. It's a message that rings true today, and one of many that the students of the time would offer to their grandchildren's generation. At your age, it's, it's wonderful to be able to have something that you believe in that much, you know? And we did. We really did. And we, we changed a heck of a lot of things, you know? I mean, I was the first in a heck of a lot of things. I think that's a lesson from the 1970s for students at Princeton today to know that you are pioneers in a whole new era, really, for modern human civilization. This is all new. This was a time where it wasn't just politics. We were caught up in the certainty that we were onto something that no generation had ever been onto before. And that, um, we were, I mean, we were gonna change the world. We really were, and it was not going to, it was going to usher in a utopian society. When I see young people, I always kind of wish that they were able to experience what we experienced. How can you, you know, lead us into a world, bring about a world that is different from the one that brought us here?